Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kyle Weatherall. I'm the International Recruitment and Admissions Coordinator here at Nipissing University. I'd like to thank you for taking the time um, to join our call uh, wherever it finds you in the world at whatever time. So good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Um, this is the first of four sessions that we'll be hosting with you. We'll be going over in our next sessions how to access your Nipissing University accounts. We'll um, welcome in other guests such as academic advising for things like course selection, residence and off-campus living to give sessions on how to secure housing here in beautiful North Bay. Uh, but for today's session, we'll turn most of our time over to Mary and Elizabeth with Mango G LLP. Uh, but before that, I'd like to welcome our president and vice chancellor, Dr. Kevin Walmsley. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome virtually to the beautiful city of North Bay. And as I was coming into my office this morning, uh, there's a little bit of a gentle snowfall uh, today. We don't have snow on the ground yet, but our weather has turned a little bit cool. And so for many of you, <clears throat> this will be quite a change and, uh, and give you the opportunity to see our four seasons, uh, which we really uh, enjoy here in Canada. I want to say a huge welcome to all of you and tell you that our faculty and staff and fellow students are absolutely thrilled that you've selected Nipissing University to pursue the next part of your career. We're very excited to welcome some of you in January uh, to join us at Nipissing University. And I can tell you that uh, our classes are full on right now. Uh, that includes in-class work, it includes internships, and it includes co-op placements. And what a wonderful um, reception that we received from our international students, just like you who arrived in September. And we've been checking up on them and they uh, have been telling me how much they are enjoying their classes here. And of course, everyone had to uh, participate in a transition, which is really why we're here today. And it's a measure of how our staff members, people like Kyle, uh, who are interested in making your transition as easy as, as possible. And that's all about information. And so in a way, you're students before you get to be students here. And, and uh, so today, your class is designated to help you with this transition to make things as easy as possible. And that includes the weather, because when you arrive in January, you're not going to be used to that. And so Kyle's team is going to prepare for you by telling you what to bring. So when you step off a plane uh, that you're not surprised. And there are many things that go uh, with enrolling at university and Kyle's mentioned some of those things. And so we're very interested in uh, making sure that you have housing when you arrive. You need to understand about the food. Uh, you need to understand about selecting courses, but more importantly, we have so many services here on, camp on campus available to you that you're probably not aware of. We're here to help you, and so when problems arise, we want you to be aware of who you should speak to when you run into an issue to make your transition very good and to make your whole experience here at Nipissing University very successful. So I think you should be excited about your journey. I know we're excited to have you, and I want to commend you for taking this step and traveling across the ocean to come to Nipissing University in beautiful North Bay. You're going to love it here. And I think you're really going to enjoy our staff, faculty and staff members uh, who are waiting for you to come. So I want to say on behalf of this great university, congratulations. And uh, we want to welcome you here um, as soon as you get here. And I wish you all the best. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Kevin. And yeah, uh, just that was just to name a few of the, the great people that we'll be bringing on future calls. We'll also have International Student Support Services and, and many other great folks from Nipissing joining us. Um, I'll also welcome to the call Eve Kalala, who's just uh, joining the audio now, uh, who's our manager of International Student Support Services. We'll definitely use most of this time um, this morning to turn things over to Elizabeth and Mary. But if Eve is available, he can also say hello and give a quick welcome to everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, good evening or good morning, uh, um, those who are this side. Uh, good evening, those who are joining us and this evening. And so I was having trouble connecting. Um, 
We are looking forward to welcoming uh, you in December or uh, January, uh, uh, depending on what time you are planning to travel. Um, and I know you've been working very hard to get to come to join us here at Nipsey University uh, in North Bay. Um, as uh, uh, Carla said, uh, this time uh, uh, a lot on the immigration side, uh, Elizabeth and Mary, uh, but I just wanted to say welcome and uh, we look forward uh, to having you come join us on campus. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we will turn it over to Elizabeth and Mary. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kyle. It's wonderful to be here today um, and to get a chance to speak with you um, before you begin your journey to Canada. Uh, the first thing I want to tell you guys is you guys have made a very good decision from an immigration perspective to come to Nipissing University. Uh, we're going to go through all the ways that you can um, have an advantage with regard to permanent residence, because you have chosen Nipissing University. Um, and um, and we'll, we'll certainly talk about that. Now, before we go into that though, we're gonna first talk about temporary residence, okay? Um, because when you come to Canada, you're going to be temporary residents first. You're gonna be international students. And as international students, you, don't have the same um, leeway, the same freedom as most of your classmates who are Canadians. You have to understand the rules that will apply to you when you are studying uh, when, uh, and the restrictions for when you're working. And then um, to make sure you're, you remain legally working, legally studying in Canada and your status is intact in, in Canada, until you get permanent residence. So first of all, let's talk about coming to Canada. Uh, so what do you need when you come to Canada? Well, when your study permit is approved, you will receive on your portal, a approval letter, okay? And on that approval letter, it will say the date, um, when the study permit is supposed to end, um, and you have to enter before that date for sure. There will also be a medical um, date for some of you who are coming from countries that require medicals, and you must also enter before that medical date. Otherwise, your um, you will have to do another medical in order to enter. Okay, so you have to keep that approval letter with you when you come to Canada. Uh, you should, if you're doing co-ops, you should also get a co-op work permit approval letter as well. Oftentimes, though, the co-op work permit approval letter, uh, the officers forget to issue them. And that could be an issue for, for some of you. If you, they don't have that, then uh, I don't know if the officer at the airport might be willing to issue you a co-op letter. Most of the time, they're not you may have to apply for a co-op work permit letter in Canada afterwards, or you can ask the visa post um, and see if they will issue you a co-op permit approval letter, okay? Um, and then for those of you who need visas, most of you would have had your passports um, requested and it would have been stamped and you would have uh, received them back. Uh, the ETAs uh, are also issued um, directly into the study permit. So if your study permit is issued um, and you don't need a visa, on the approval letter, they would have stated that ETA uh, was also issued with you. So essentially, those are the things that you will need in order to enter Canada. When you get to the Canadian uh, airport, the first airport that you enter, that will be the airport where you need to go and obtain your study permit. So when you come to Canada and you're going through customs, the officer will say, what do you want to do in Canada? And you'll say, I'm here to study. I have a study permit approval. And they'll sh and likely send you then to the immigration office. At the immigration office, you present to them your passport and your approval letter. And then the officer will issue you the study permit. Now, it's very important 
that when your study permit is printed, you look at it very carefully in front of the officer. If you go and you just take the study permit and you leave and there are mistakes on the study permit, it is going to be quite painful for you to change the study permit. And it will be lengthy periods of time. There may be, uh, you may have to pay it more fees, et cetera, if you need to change it inside, the, inside Canada. So when you have the study permit printed out, don't just leave right away. Look at it very carefully. I mean, some of the obvious things are, you know, your name, date of birth. How long is your study permit issued for? Normally, the study permit should be issued until until 90 days after your study program ends. Okay, 90 days after your study program ends. If your passport expires earlier, the officers can only issue the study permit until when your passport uh, expires though okay and then you'll have to file an extension also make sure that the study permit does not say not authorized to work as students and we're going to talk about this afterwards you are authorized to work but the system the electronic system where the officers use to print out these study permits they have the default there oftentimes where they print out not authorized to work. And if you have a study permit that says not authorized to work, that may prohibit you to obtain a social insurance number so that you can work and receive payroll. Um, and then you'll have to file and you know, change it in, in, in Canada, et cetera, and it will be a little bit painful to do so. So if you look at it and it says not authorized to work, you can ask the officer to change that, okay? Uh, you know, so things like uh, locations, it, sh it shouldn't restrict you necessarily on locations. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes if you need to be working in healthcare or education uh, or with children, and you're especially, you know, you want to work in that area. And if you have already had a medical done, then there shouldn't be any restrictions on your work permit restricting you from working in healthcare or with children. That oftentimes is another one of those default lines that the system generates. And if the officer isn't careful, then that condition can also be on there. So if you want to work perhaps with children or healthcare, make sure that, and you've done your medicals, then you shouldn't have that condition on your study permit either, okay? All right. Okay. So when you hold a study permit, it opens up some options for your family members as well. So if you're married, then your spouse can get an open work permit so that they can work while you study. And this applies if you're married legally or if you're in a common law relationship. And it's important to understand what being in a common law relationship means. So you can be there's one distinction where you're legally married, you have a marriage certificate or a license, um, but the other option is being in a common law relationship. If you've lived with somebody for 12 months in a conjugal relationship, immigration considers that to be a common law relationship, and your common law partner can get an open work permit as well while you study. So this is important to keep in mind while you're in Canada because many of immigration's programs are impacted by this common law relationship rule. So you need to mark the date when you started living together with your partner. And when you are filling out your forms for immigration, you need to make sure that you disclose it if you are in a common law relationship. So if you've been living with somebody in a conjugal relationship for 12 months, and you're filling out the forms and they're asking you what your marital status is. There's options for single, married, common law, et cetera. And you need to select that you are common law married so that you're being truthful with immigration and also so that you can uh, take advantage of things like the common law partner open spousal work permit. Um, there are also options for your dependent children when you have a study permit. So your dependent children can accompany you and they can study here in Canada as well. 
They can attend grade school on a study permit or a visitor record that's connected to your study permit. And because you as their parent have a study permit, they don't have to pay international student fees for grade school. Um, they could also be eligible for an open work permit if they want to work. So think about your family members and how they might be impacted or what options might be open for them because you hold a study permit. Great. Let's talk about what you need to think about when you are here in Canada. Okay. So like I said, you're not going to be in the same situation as your Canadian classmates. As international students, there are a lot of rules surrounding when you're allowed to work, how long you're allowed to work, and um, how to keep your student status. So first of all, talking about keeping your student status. Even if you have a study permit that's good for one year, two years, four years, it doesn't mean that you're safe and you will, no matter what you do, you will have student status until the end of the study permit. The study permit will is there and you can you can be in Canada to study for as long as it's valid. But if you don't actively pursue studies, means go to class, you know, be enrolled as a full time, uh, be enrolled as a student, okay, then you will lose your student status 90 days after you have stopped studying, you have stopped to actively pursue studies. Now, there are two uh, exceptions to this rule. One is scheduled breaks. So anytime the school has a break, for example, summer holidays or, you know, other holidays, etc., that's on the academic calendar. If everybody in the program has this break, that's a scheduled break. You don't need to worry about that. The other thing that is available is more individualized. Let's say there are some specific reasons. Let's say you got really sick and you're not able to attend classes for a semester. In that situation, you can go to the school, let them know the reason why you can't attend this semester, and you can then um, ask them to give you permission it's called authorized leave to not attend classes for that and not be enrolled for that one semester. The max you can do for authorized leave at any given time is 150 days. So if you do have authorized leave, then you can take the semester off and that is still counted as the actively pursuing studies. You won't lose your status if you have permission beforehand from the university. Working while you are studying, okay? You can only work if you are a full-time student. If you are a part-time student, if you're enrolled as a part-time student, you cannot work at all, okay? Uh, the only exception to that is if you are in the last semester. So in the last semester, um, the IRCC does recognize that some people Maybe you're just missing a, a, a course or two before you can graduate. Um, so you, last semester, you can be part-time and you can work as well. Now, once you've completed your studies, you are no longer going to be a, a student, okay? And in that situation, you have to stop working. Um, a lot of students think, oh, I haven't gotten my degree yet. So I'm still a student, right? No, 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 no. If you have received the first indication from the school, whether or not they give you a letter, whether or not you received your transcripts that says, congratulations, you completed all of the requirements of your program and you are now eligible to graduate. At that point, IRCC says, you're no longer a full-time student. You're no longer then able to work at all part you know 20 hours full time not at all okay the only exception to that rule is if you've completed one program and then um 
you're going to you've already been accepted to another program and and there's only one semester break in between the two programs let's say i finished my undergrad in april uh, of next year and then uh, i'm going to start my masters in september of the same year in that case if you've already been accepted you can work in between the programs and the max in between is 150 days of separation. Okay, so max is one semester. Okay, so something that's also very important to keep track of while you're a student is to always make sure that you have status while you're studying here in Canada. So what you need to do is check your study permit and look at the date that's listed as the expiry date and note it down in your calendar right now. Once you reach that expiry date, you don't you no longer have status as a student, even if your program isn't over yet. So, for example, if your study permit expires before you complete your program of study, you need to apply to extend your study permit so that you're allowed to continue studying, even if your study permit has expired, but your program is still going. And another key thing to understand is implied status. So when you submit an application to extend your study permit, as long as you submit the extension properly and before the expiry date that's listed on your permit, you'll hold what's called implied status or maintained status. And that means that you can continue studying while you're waiting for a decision on your application. That This only works if you apply for the extension before the expiry date and you make sure that all of the documents that you include in the application are correct and it's properly filed then you're allowed to continue studying in Canada while you wait for IRCC to process that application. If you do have implied status, it does require you to be in Canada while you wait for a decision on the new application. Otherwise, if you leave Canada, your implied status will end. Another important thing to talk about is restoration. So say you wake up one day and you realize, oops, I didn't note my expiry date on my study permit, and now it's actually past the expiry date, um, what should I do? So from the expiry date, you have a period of 90 days to restore your status as a student. So if you lose your status, you can apply to get your status back by submitting a restoration application. And it's important to keep in mind that the deadlines on restoration are very, very strict. So you have 90 days from when you lose your status to apply for restoration, which means if you miss the expiry on your study permit, it's 90 days from that expiry date. Or if you applied to restore your status, but then that application is refused, you have 90 days from the date on the refusal letter to submit a restoration application. All right, let's talk about the post-grad work permit. The post-grad work permit is probably the biggest reward that international students get. Uh, from studying in Canada. And what it is, is it allows you to have an open work permit to work anywhere you want in Canada, okay? Now, this is a big reward because um, most work permits don't work that way. Most work permits, if you were just, you know, you haven't graduated, you want to get a work permit in Canada, you would have to find an employer who uh, is willing to not only hire you, but can show that they can't find a Canadian to do the job and they have to apply for an LMIA. And then you would, uh, if they are willing and they're able to get an LMIA, then you would uh, be able to work for them only in that particular position. Most of the time, if you're coming from outside of the country, getting these LMIAs is near to impossible to get, okay? I know that I've heard that there are fraudsters out there that sell these LMIAs, et cetera, for exorbitant amount of money. That is fraud and that's not allowed, but the legitimate, job offers with the LMIAs, most employers wouldn't necessarily be willing to do that. But as international students, when you graduate, you can apply for the postgrad work permit. However, the postgrad work permits are not all the same in terms of length. 
And because normally you're only able to get one post-grad work permit in your life. Now, recently in the recent years since COVID, the government has had some temporary policies where they have said that um, they have allowed international students to extend their work permits, but that's temporary. Uh, there may be changes coming up in the future for students as well. Uh, so it really, you know, one of the things that we are restricted right now to telling you is we can only tell you what is the law right now. Um, but we will be putting you guys on our newsletter list. And when news comes that may affect you, we will generally uh, put it on our newsletter and send that news out to you guys, okay? Um, and so we are anticipating that there will be changes later on to the postgrad work permit sometime maybe in the next few months, and we'll let you know. But for now, here is what the rules are. Number one, you can only get one postgrad work permit in your lifetime. So we always advise people to try to keep that in mind when deciding what kind of program you want to do. Because if your program is only between eight to 12 months, uh, eight to 24 months, to, um, and I'm talking academic years, not um, calendar years, okay? So for example, some people, if you did a 16 month program, but it consists of four semesters, there's no break in between, that can be counted as two academic years, okay? Uh, so if you did anything, like if you did a one-year program, you're only going to be able to get a one-year work permit. If you did a two-year program, you can get a three-year work permit. If you do a one-year uh, program, and then you did another one-year program, so then that's two years in total, well, two years of study program would still equal to a three-year work permit. Now, some things to keep in mind in order to qualify for the postgrad work permit, the rule is that distance education, anything where you have classes that are online classes, it should form less than 50% of your program. Okay. Also, very importantly, you must have maintained full time student status during every semester of your program, except the last semester, okay? And if you have authorized leave, okay? Now the authorized leave is for you to take the entire semester off. The authorized leave is not for you to be a part-time student. Sometimes I have um, clients who tell me, oh, you know what, Elizabeth, I'm having trouble being a full-time student for this semester. I'm going to be failing some of my classes. I'm just going to drop some classes, okay? Is that okay? No, it's not. Not if you want to get that post-grad work permit. If you are going to be failing any classes, as an immigration lawyer, I would rather see that you have taken the class and received a failure on your course then for you to have dropped the class and become a part-time student because if you are a part-time student in any semester other than the final semester you are not going to be eligible for the post-grad work permit okay now we're going to talk about when it is that you should apply for your postgrad work permit, okay? Um, and I'm going to start with a with a timeline here, okay? So first of all, when you're writing your full time final exams, okay, you are a full time student, so you can work at that time. When you finish your exams. You're waiting for your results. Results have not come yet. Still a full-time student. You can work at that time. Now, when the school has notified you, however, that you have completed your program, you have received the grades, it shows that you've passed, you've completed your program. At that point, IRCC says, well, you're no longer a student at that point. 
and you have to stop working. Now, if you submit, however, your postgrad work permit within 90 days of the completion of your program, and, and if your study permit is still valid, you can start working full time while waiting for your postgrad work permit, even if you're you don't have the work permit in your hand. Okay, and this is within Canada. So why is it some of you, if you're really astute, you might go on the IRCC website and say, hey, you know, it says it there that I can apply for my postgrad work permit within 180 days until I graduate. Why are you saying that it's 90 days? The reason why I say it's 90 days is in order to qualify for a postgrad work permit, you and to continue to work while waiting for the work permit, you have to be have student status. What is one of the first things I told you guys about losing your student status? You lose it 90 days after you finished your program. You're no longer a student. So if you do it after 90 days, you have to file a restoration of status for students and you cannot work at that point. So keep in mind the rule. You have to submit your postgrad work permit. How many days? 90 days after you finish your program. And if your study permit expires earlier than that, then you have to apply before your study permit expires. Okay. All right. Now let's get to permanent residents. Okay, so as Elizabeth was mentioning, um, once you graduate, you could get a postgrad work permit, which is a great way to start qualifying towards PR. And it's going to allow you to work for any employer in Canada. So you'll find that after you graduate, many of the programs for permanent residency that we're going to talk about require you to have high skilled work experience. So it's important to understand the difference between what makes a job a high skilled job or a low skilled job so that you know if it's going to qualify you and keep your PR options open. So how do you know if your job is considered high or low skilled? Um, IRCC has categorized all the different jobs into what are called national occupation codes or NOC codes. And the NOC codes are divided into six tiers. So tier zero, one, two, and three are considered high skilled, whereas tier four and five are considered low skilled. And just last year, this whole system changed. Some jobs that used to be considered high skilled became low skilled, and some jobs that used to be considered low skilled became high skilled. Um, some examples of that are um, high skilled jobs are now truck drivers, personal support workers, et cetera, whereas some of those high skilled jobs that turned into low skilled jobs were tailors, other performers. And we, we have listed the changes on these slides, which will become available to you later on. Um, but the important thing to note is that the skill level, skill level is really important to understand when you're choosing whether you want to accept a job or not. Because if it's not in tier zero, one, two, or three, then it's not going to qualify for many of the PR programs. And you need to figure this out for your particular individual situation. Sometimes we see students making the mistake of just relying on what their friends have done in the past or what they read about online or see in forums. And the problem with that is that because the system can change and it's really based on your individual situation and the job that you're going to do, you can run into big problems later on if it turns out that you were incorrect in your assumptions and it turns out that your job was actually low skilled. So you really need to make sure that you have proper advice on what knock your specific job falls under and whether it's going to work for different PR routes. Um, and as I said, there's a list here on the slides for you to see and we'll be sending those out later. All right. Now let's get into the different ways you can apply for permanent residence. The most well-known uh, program is called Express Entry. Many of you may have already heard about this, okay? There's a lot of uh, misinformation out there as well. So let's 
talk about the overall uh, picture. So in order to apply for permanent residence through express entry, first you have to create an online pro uh, profile and you can qualify to do so uh, if you qualify under one of the three categories, federal skilled worker class, Canadian experience class, or the federal skilled trades class. Once you've qualified and you've created an online profile, you'll be able to enter into the express entry pool. Now, a lot of people think, oh, I've entered into the express entry pool. That means I've applied for permanent residence, right? No, you have not applied for permanent residence when you enter the express entry pool. What you have done is you have expressed your interest in applying and you have shown that you may qualify to apply. But when you enter the pool, you will get a series of points based on your background, based on whether you have received a nomination from a province related to the express entry system. And every two weeks or so, the government has a draw where they invite people based on what your score is. Uh, they sometimes have invited people based on how you qualify to be in the pool, which category you applied. And starting this summer, they now have category-based draws as well, okay? So it's only after you receive this invitation to apply that you can actually then submit your application and apply. Without getting the invitation to apply, you have not applied you are just in the pool. If you're in the pool for a year, the system kicks you out and you can put yourself back into the pool. But really, you what we do most of the time is look at someone's chances of getting invited to apply. Uh, not only if, looking at your ability to get into the pool, but looking at someone's chances to get an invitation to apply, seeing and advising on how you can raise your chances to get an invitation to apply and also looking at other options as well for you. All right, so just wanted to quickly talk about how to qualify for the Express Entry Program. The first program is called the Federal Skilled Worker Class. Some of you may already qualify to get into the pool under this program. If you have at least one year of high skilled work experience in one occupation, um, that is uh, continuous um, and uh, full-time, at least 30 hours a week, which equals to 1,560 hours, or uh, in part-time, you can add those hours together, then uh, you may qualify. You also We also take a look at your language score, your education, and you have to meet a minimum score there. And there you have to have a certain amount of financial savings. Um, this work experience is very different from the work experience required for the, ne the, the next um, category, which is called the Canadian Experience Plus. We can use work experience that you gained while you when you're outside of Canada. We can also use work experience you gained when you're self-employed as well. And also work experience that you gained while you're studying in Canada as well, okay, so it's very different uh, from the second category, which is the Canadian Experience Class. The Canadian Experience Class, to qualify for this, the work experience is very specific. The work experience for that requires that you have one year of work experience in Canada that is high skilled. It does not have to be in one occupation, it could be in different occupations, but it has to be high skilled um, in Canada, you have to be an employee. You cannot be self-employed for this. And you can't uh, count the work experience you gained while you are a full-time student, okay? This work experience, what I described here, those conditions are essentially the same as when we look at work experience 
to give you points later on for express entry in Canada, okay? So keep in mind, the points for work experience in Canada is same as the work experience under the Canadian experience class to qualify for permanent residence. And that is one year of high-skilled work experience um, in Canada, where you're not a full-time student uh, and you have to be an employee. That means in Canada, you, sh you should get a T4 slip you should have your um your your salary will be docked CPP EI and income tax as well. I'm not going to talk too much about the third one. This is more for people in this trades, um, in construction trades and and such. Okay. All right. Now let's say you can get into the pool. Well, how do you get the points? so that you can get an invitation to apply and get out of the pool. The first thing, age. Age is a major dividing factor. By the time you get to your 30s, your age points start dropping. Every year in your 30s is minus five, minus six. When you get to your 40s, it's minus 10, minus 11. By the time you get to your 45th birthday, the good news is, your points don't, don't go down anymore. The bad news is you get a big fat zero. Compared to someone in their 20s who get over 100 points, that could make a big difference in your ability to get invited to apply, okay? There's not a lot you can do about age except apply as earlier rather than waiting later um, if you have the factors uh, to apply. Education. Uh, if you have two programs that really bumps you up, two post-secondary programs, so one should be at least three years in length and another program on top, that bumps you up as well, okay? Language, language, they're really looking at a very high level of language. Um, normally right now, because the points are very high, uh, oftentimes we would like to see points of at least um, sevens in reading, writing, and speaking, uh, and eight in listening for IELTS, okay? Um, and the language points, I mean, sometimes if you're lower, but you have a lot of other points, that's great, but especially if you don't have much work experience in Canada, that's likely going to be the language points we're looking at. The work experience, the Canadian work experience that you gain after your finished your studies that I described for the Canadian experience class that has significant uh, points for you. If you have outside of Canada work experience that's high skilled, that's at least a year in length, it's the first level is one to two years. If you have three years, that bumps you up even more. Okay, so that can be quite important. Sometimes, unfortunately, I see people who have only 11 months of foreign work experience. You just stopped working a month before uh, you wanted to come to Canada. It's really unfortunate to have that because you need to have that 12 months to give you that boost in points. Uh, if you have a spouse, so either you're married or you have common law uh, status, so a common law relationship, like Mary was telling uh, you, you can include them in your application and their background will either boost up your points or maybe subtract a little bit from your points. Provincial nominee program. Um, Mary is going to talk about provincial nominee programs. Uh, the provincial nominee program is every province has... Um, so, okay, let me go back. The federal government, the government of Canada is in charge of uh, immigration overall, okay? But the federal government has made an agreement with every province to allow each province to also choose for their own programs who they want to get permanent residence. And that's called provincial nominee programs. So Ontario, had our, we have a provincial nominee program called the OINP. Ontario Immigrant Nominee Program. And Mary is going to let you guys know about that, okay? 
so if you previously studied in Canada, like if you did your bachelor's or master's or PhD in, in, in Nipissing, you get 30 points, which can make a big difference. Arranged employment. A lot of people think, oh, I have a work permit. It's a postgrad work permit and I have a job offer. That means I have arranged employment points, right? No. Arranged employment is only when you have an employer-specific work permit or LMIA um, and, a, and a work permit. And, you know, we can help people look at that, look at those options and see whether or not that may be an option when you graduate. By the way, for those people who do have partners uh, who are coming with them and they can get open work permits, they can get this work experience. They can also apply as principal applicants as well. So if you have a partner with you, we would always want to have a consultation with both of you as a family because you guys can then team up. One person can be studying, the other person can be working. It doesn't matter who is the principal applicant, the whole family gets permanent residence together, okay? Uh, so if you have brothers or sisters who are Canadians or permanent residents in Canada, that can add some points. Fluency in French is going to be quite important. Trade certification, that is mostly for people in the construction trades. All right, now, one more thing about express entry is the fact that starting this summer, the, the government has now had some new categories where what's like normally they'll just invite everybody who's in the pool who meets their cutoff line, okay? But they have started now these new category-based draws where they look at, for example, someone has French, uh, very fluent in French over CLBF7, in French, then um, you can, they might have a French draw where only people who uh, at, are at that level are invited to apply. Then the pool becomes much smaller. Um, and because the pool comes much smaller, the number of points that a person normally needs for these category-based draws, if you fit in the category, will be lower, okay? Um, so there's French language, and then there's a lot of other occupations where if you have six months of work experience in this occupation in the last three years, then uh, you could qualify for the category-based draws. And I've put here the link. We'll be sending out these slides to you if you've registered and we'll give you um, uh, more information. You can click on that and see if some of your occupations might qualify, okay? Now, uh, one thing I did want to mention before we move on from Express Entry is, uh, remember how I said you guys made a very good decision on immigration? One of the decisions right now that you made a good decision on is the fact that you are not going to Quebec, okay? Because if you wanted to go to Quebec, in order to immigrate in Quebec, um you would not be able to apply under express entry. In fact, most of the permanent residence programs in Quebec for economic-based programs will require the applicants to speak French. So if you're not fluent in French, even if you're fluent in French, express entry is a six months pro process. And you know there's so many advantages to being able to speak French under express entry. You're gonna get permanent residence much, much faster than permanent residence in Quebec which will take around two years to process. Okay, so as Elizabeth mentioned, there are other ways to get points in express entry that are outside of the CRS points that we talked about. Um, so the other ways to do this are related to the provincial nominee programs, which are also called PNPs. So PNPs are programs for immigration where a province has made an agreement with the federal government so that they have the ability to select people who they want to get permanent residence in their own province. Ontario's provincial nominee program is called the OINP. So the OINP has different kinds of streams. The express entry streams are linked directly to an express entry account. So if you receive a nomination from Ontario through these streams, 
it gives you 600 extra points to your express entry score, which basically ensures that you're going to be able to apply for permanent residence. So how do they work? In Ontario, you can't just go and apply to the express entry OINP streams. First, you actually have to be in the express entry pool. Then you wait to receive a, nom a notification of interest from Ontario. So you firstly, you get into the express entry pool, and then only if Ontario is interested in you, they'll send you a notification of interest. So who are they going to give those notifications of interest to? So there's three categories that they've identified. The first is the human capital stream. So in order to qualify for this stream, firstly, you have to be, you have to qualify for express entry for one of the express entry streams. In this stream, you also need to have a bachelor's degree. It doesn't have to be from Canada. It can be from overseas. They also specify um, certain people or categories that they're interested in. So for example, this was before the new category based express entry draws came in. The capital, the human capital stream had already prioritized drawing people, giving invitations to people who were working in tech um, or people with job offers or certain work experience. The next stream is the French speaking stream. So this is a stream for people who have a bachelor's degree and a high level of French, which is at a CLB level of seven and a six in English. So if you're in the express entry stream with those qualifications, you could get an invitation through this French speaking stream. The third stream is targeting people in the skilled trades. So if you're in one of these identified um, construction trades and you've been working in that occupation for at least a year in Ontario in the last two years, you don't need a bachelor's degree. As long as you have a work permit and you've been working for one year in a skilled trade, you could receive an invitation from Ontario. Okay. So next, there are, aside from the express entry linked streams, there are also other streams that Ontario has, which are totally outside of express entry. So these streams have different requirements than the express entry link streams, and they also have a different application process. So for these streams, you don't need an express entry profile, and they're, and they're specific to Ontario's own portal and their own stream. So with these streams, the, the process of applying is different. They use what's called an expression of interest system. So for anyone who's qualified through the programs, the first step is to put yourself into the OINP pool for the particular program that you'll qualify for. Then once you've registered your expression of interest, you have to wait to be selected. So you're waiting for Ontario to do a draw and give you a notification of interest. Ontario does OINP draws, but they don't announce them beforehand. And it's hard to sometimes predict exactly when they're going to do a draw. So it's best to just get in the pool as soon as possible once you do qualify for one of these streams, because you can't get an invitation if you're not in the pool. So if you do get selected, they issue you a letter called a notification of interest, and then you apply to get your nomination. Once that goes through, you can apply for PR. So where express entry is two steps, the OINP non-express entry streams or the expression of interest streams are a few more steps. There's about three. Um, and the streams themselves are also different. So they give points differently than express entry. And some streams require you to have a job offer, for example. Uh, I'll get into those in a moment. And then other streams, for example, like the PhD and master streams don't require job offers. So the PhD and master's streams. Um, uh, just before we get into that, I just wanted to point out one thing for you guys. If you guys study uh, in Northern Ontario, where you guys, where North Bay is, and if you have a job offer in North Bay, all of those things give you a whole lot more of extra points for these OIMP applications. Another advantage to studying at Nipissing. Exactly. And it can account for things, for example, Express Entry might not give you those extra points, but you can collect them under the OINP, which is great. Um, I believe the next slide discusses, yes, okay. So the OINP Masters and PhD streams are for graduates from Ontario Masters and PhD programs. 
To qualify for these OINP streams, you have to apply within two years of graduation from your program. So this means you have to register your expression of interest, receive an invitation from the province, and apply for nomination before it's been two years since you graduated. And what this means is that if you've completed a master's or a PhD from Ontario, don't wait around. Register your expression of interest right away so that you qualify as soon as possible and you don't miss the chance to get an invitation. Um, one of the nice things about the OINP master's and PhD stream is you don't need a job offer for these streams, um, but you do need to be looking to enter the labor market. So if you did your master's and then you're about to go do your PhD, this, this isn't the stream for you. Okay, and then we have the employer-based um, OINP categories, I believe. Next slide. So the employer-based um, OINP programs are where you need to have a job offer and you need to, as the applicant, meet certain requirements and also have a job offer from an employer that meets certain requirements through this stream. So I'll go through a few of them. So for all of these streams, the business that's supporting your application needs to have been in business for at least three years. If the business is inside of the GTA, they have to show that their gross income in the last fiscal year was $1 million and that they have five full-time Canadian citizen or PR employees. If they're outside of the GTA, so outside of the greater Toronto area, like if they're in North Bay, for example, uh, they only have to have a $500,000 income in the last uh, fiscal year, and they only need to have three full-time Canadian or PR employees. So the job offer has to be full-time and permanent, and permanent means no end date on your contract. Um, and then there's a few streams within this area. So there's the international student stream. Um, and this is where if you've completed your program of study in Ontario, you also need to apply within two years of graduation and you have to have graduated from an eligible program, which means that you've done a two-year program or you've done a one-year postgraduate program from an eligible school. For the one-year programs, one of the admission requirements for the program has to have been that a degree was required so keep that in mind if you're thinking about this category. The other thing you'll need is a high skilled job offer and you need to be paid at least what's considered the low wage for your occupation according to where you are employed. Another stream is the skilled worker stream. So for this stream, you need to have at least two years of work experience in the last five years in the same occupation as your job offer. That work experience doesn't need to have been in Canada. It doesn't have to have been in Ontario. It just has to show that you do have two years of experience in the last five years in the same area as your job offer. It has to be high skilled. Um, you have to receive, your salary has to be the median wage for your location. And there are no education requirements for this stream. So you don't have to have any specific education background. Another stream is called the in-demand job stream. So the OINP has a list of occupations that qualify for this program. It's not just every occupation, it's a very specific list. And it's one of the only OINP streams that includes low-skilled job offers and positions. So if you or, for example, your spouse qualifies or there are, is working in a low-skilled position, you could potentially qualify for this stream. So for you need nine months of experience in Ontario in that low skilled job occup pardon me in that low in that occupation, uh, but it can be with different employers. And the salary that you need to receive is the median wage for the occupation. Now let's talk about the ARNIP program, okay? Rural and Northern Immigration Program. So finally, the the third advantage for you know studying in Nipissing is that uh, it's in North Bay. There are only a handful of programs, uh, of communities in Canada where you can participate in an RNIP program, and one of them is North Bay. And so in order to qualify for the RNIP program, you have to have at least either one year of qualifying work experience. It could be from outside of Canada or, or in Canada, uh, or uh, you have graduated from the eligible study program, okay? And if it, to be eligible, it has to be two years um, where at least 18 months uh, you're studying in the community, okay? 
And, or if you're doing a master's or PhD, a master, PhD is never under two years, but master's can be one year, that's also okay. Um, and you normally would need to have a qualifying job offer in the community. What is qualifying job offer? It really depends uh, on the um, requirements of the community. Um, I can, you know, if you come and you let me know what your job offer, I can, I can take a look at your circumstances and whether or not you are likely to get a recommendation from the participating community. Um, you need to meet language benchmarks. That shouldn't be an issue for you guys if you guys are going to Nipissing. If you have a spouse and they have the work experience, they can also qualify for this. They do need to meet the language benchmark. And if you're working in Canada, you're fine. You don't need settlement funds. If you're not, you need settlement funds, okay? So if you do uh, have a job offer um, and it's, it's a permanent job offer in the community, do let us know. Um, come for a consultation. We can see if an ARNIP program would be a good option for you. All right, so we have talked a lot about different programs. I'm sure a lot of you are, are getting a little bit of a headache. It's a, it's a lot of information to take in. Um, I'm, we're going to now give you some practical pieces of advice to keep in mind as you continue on your journey in Canada. Okay, so the first piece of advice is to have a plan as to what you need to do to get to your immigration goals. So that doesn't mean just a short term plan, but also a long term plan. If you're planning on getting PR eventually, you need to make sure that you're on the right track. Um, so once you come for a consultation where you have a plan for your, yourself specifically, then you need to have the determination to get there, okay? And sometimes it could be, you may need to change your program or you may need to do a, another program. It could be that you really need to buckle down and study that, uh, you know, English IELTS, CELPIP, the French exams, if French is, you know, one of your languages. I have a lot, I have a lot of people coming to me who, you know, their English exam is not that great a grade and they have never studied French before. And they're like, oh, how about if I study French? You know, we have to be realistic on, you know, a person's capabilities, right? But um, sometimes if you're almost there with regard to your language and you just need maybe 0.5 more or one point more, or you didn't do well on your language exams, that's something where sometimes studying can really, really make a difference. But you have to have the determination and time to do that. You may need to look at the kind of work and jobs that you need to have as well, okay? Um, the next thing is make sure that you stay in status and you don't misrepresent. So keep a close eye on those expiry dates on your permits and tell the truth to immigration. So lying or providing incorrect information on an application can result in a five-year ban from Canada, which will get in the way of any of your immigration plans. And finally, hopefully this doesn't happen, but if it does contact if your application is rejected contact a lawyer right away there is a huge huge difference in canada between a lawyer and those people who are consultants in canada a lawyer goes to law school we have the legal training and if something goes wrong we know how to fix it we can tr we can go to federal court uh we can ask for reconsiderations don't go to a consultant, go to a lawyer, okay? You have to go right away as well. There are very, very strict periods of time when you can go to federal court. For example, it's only 15 days if your decision is made in Canada. If your study permit is rejected outside Canada, you have 60 days to do that, okay? But if you don't file the notice with the court, within that time period, you're out of luck. You can't go and say, oh, it's unfair. I want to go to court after this period. Okay. Also, sometimes people say, well, I'm, I'm going to call the call center because, you know, the Canadian government, they're so nice and friendly. They're going to help me. I think they made a mistake. I'll just call them and, and see if the call center agent will help me. Don't do that. 
the call center agent is not your friend. The call center agent may be nice, but they also don't, are not, they're not even officers and they give wrong legal advice all of the time. And if you follow their advice to your detriment, that is on you. They don't care. And in the end, the consequence, you bear the consequences for that. When you call the call center, they may say, oh, okay, why don't you just uh, write a letter to immigration? Or, oh, okay, I'll put a note on there for you. If you do that and you don't know what to say and you get back a response, no, we're not, we don't think you're right. That is your one chance for reconsideration. You don't have two chances for reconsideration. If that happens, then you come to me and say, Elizabeth, I need to file reconsideration. I said, I can't. You're not even going to look at what I submit because you've already filed your reconsideration. Okay. Also, there is very strict timelines for restoration, time you can apply for postgrad work permit, etc. So make sure you do contact a lawyer right away when your application is rejected. Awesome. Okay, let's start answering some questions. Here's our information, by the way, if you wanted to book a consultation with us, we do everything uh, by Zoom. And, uh, you know, you, Mary is, is one of our uh, main uh, people who will meet with you and go over a plan for you um, and, and see what your options are as well. All right, let's okay. go through these questions. So first up, we've got, um, is a co-op work permit similar to a work visa? A co-op work permit is a form of a work permit. There are many, many different work permits in Canada. And every kind of work permit will have specific conditions on it, okay? So a co-op work permit allows you to work in a program that is specific to the co-op program. It has to be integral to your education program. So let's say, you know, as part of your program, uh, you need to do a co-op with, with a company, okay? And that's a four-month co-op program. Fantastic. You can work full-time as part of the internship co-op program that's part of your education program. Now, let's say the company afterwards wants you to continue to work with them. You can continue to work with them if you're allowed to, based on you being an international full-time student, you can work 20 hours off campus for them. You can work full-time on campus, but if they're not on campus, 20 hours off campus for them. But you cannot use this co-op work permit to allow you to work off campus for them full-time if this working for them is not part of your education program. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, somebody asked, um, is environment gra graduation have internship? I think that might be one for Kyle or Eve to answer. Um, what is other performers in high skilled? I think this is referring to the high skilled blockchain. There are, there are lots of the NOC codes, there's hundreds of occupations that the government has, uh, uh, you know, grouped into what, which tier it is. And um, as uh, Mary has said, zero, one, two, three are high skilled, four and five are low skilled. So other performers, you can go and take a look at that. I believe other performers are now considered that what the government has termed to be other performers are now deemed to be low skilled. Previously, they were high skilled. It depends on what exactly you're doing. If you are an artist, by the way, and you have been able to be self-employed, we do have special programs for um, artists who are able to support yourself in Canada um, for as a self-employed program. So if you are an artist, do let us know um, if like cultural activities, et cetera, uh, or athletes as well. Uh, we can look into programs for you. Okay. Uh, could you please explain what PNP is again? PNP is Provincial Nominee Programs. Every province has their own Provincial Nominee Programs. And these are programs for the, uh, the Ontario government 
not IRCC, but the Ontario government first gets to uh, gets to decide who will want to apply, who they want to get a, a permanent residence. So Ontario's provincial nominee program is the OINP, and Mary went through the programs for that. By the way, this is going to be recorded. Um, if you want to watch it over again, you can um, give me maybe a week or so to um, edit it and put it on YouTube, and then you can access it on, on the YouTube channel as well. So you can, you can go through those programs that Mary had talked about, okay? Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Um, I think this is specific. Again, we've got PBD degree students can apply in OINP. I'm not sure what PBD is. Uh, Move on for now. Yeah, well, we'll look. Uh, yeah. Um, can I renew my passport as an international student in Canada with a study permit? It's going to expire in May 2025. You can certainly renew your passport. I don't have any... I don't know how the different countries work and, you know, you go to your embassy and see how you can renew your passport in Canada. Um, but if your study, per your study permit, your work permits, they will not be issued past your, the expiry date of your passport. So what we would highly recommend is make sure that you renew your passports as soon as possible so that you can apply for extensions on your study permit and work permits as well. Great. Okay, is PBO considered a post-graduation program? Again, not sure what PBO is. So a post-graduation program that qualifies for the international student stream. Very importantly, it's a program where as a prerequisite, everybody who goes to that program must not, it's good to have, must have a degree. Not a diploma, not work experience, must have a degree. Great. Um, eligibility for scholarship, I think Kyle or Eve can take that. Um, PBD, eligible for co-op work permit. I'm uh, very curious about what PBD. Eve or Kyle, can you explain what a PBD is? Uh, hi, yeah, for sure. So uh, PBD is post-baccalaureate diploma. So many of the students on the oh. call... We'll be joining that, and you put it very well, Elizabeth. That's exactly the prerequisite for us is an undergraduate degree for uh, admission into that. And I'll just add quickly as well for the questions um, that we're trying to answer about admissions or uh, recruitment or other topics other than uh, immigration law, uh, you're always welcome to send those questions to international admiss at nipsingu.ca or the most appropriate office here at the university. Uh, we work diligently to answer all of your questions. So please never be shy to get the right information that you'll need. Um, and like I said at the beginning of the call, maybe for some of you who joined in and missed, we will be hosting other sessions and reaching out and inviting you to those sessions where we'll have different fro folks from the university um, join in and, and give you all of that information. So thank you for the questions. It's, it's great. And if we don't answer them in the chat, please, please feel free to send them to international admiss at nipsingu.ca. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kyle. Um, okay, so is PBD eligible for co-op? That just depends on the, uh, the your program. Does your program have a co-op component to it? If it does have a co-op component, then you should be you should apply, get your co-op work right. If it doesn't, then you don't get a co-op work from it. And just to piggyback off that for all of the students, um, yeah, please review your letter of acceptance in great detail for these questions like scholarships and uh, co-op opportunities. These will be very clearly laid out in your letter of acceptance. And it's just generally also very important to read uh, even the fine print, all of the details on that letter of acceptance so that you know what you must do to be in compliance with it. Thank you. Great. Okay, this one says, application is rejected. I'm sorry to ask, do you mean the visa application we filed to the Canadian Embassy, or is there can be any rejection after getting the visa? Any rejection. Now, once you get your study permit approved and you get your visa and your passport, then your application is approved. It's not rejected. But afterwards, you can have a work permit rejected. You can have a study permit rejected if you want to extend your study permit. Any sort of immigration rejection, make sure you contact a lawyer right away. 
you know, you, it's so disappointing. Sometimes I get people coming to us after, you know, they've gone past the date because they try to fix it on their own. And we don't, we could have easily fixed it if you had come to us uh, in time, but you just sort of missed the deadline because you didn't know what to do. So we're telling you what to do. Uh, so no more, if, if, hopefully this doesn't happen, right? Hopefully you get proper advice in the beginning so that it doesn't happen. But if it does, uh, we're here. You, you know who to call. Um, job options available in North Bay. That's <laughs> that'll be depend on you when you get over here. Yep. Um, social insurance number. How can I get a social insurance number? So when you have your study permit, you can go to the Service Canada and apply for your social insurance number using your study permit. Like I said, if your study permit says you cannot work, not authorized to work, then Service Canada will likely not give you the social insurance number. So make sure you check your study permit very carefully at the beginning. And if you do have a study permit um, that says that, then you can apply to amend your study permit. Uh, and you can do that online. And then once you get the new study permit, you can get your social insurance number. Now, as temporary residents, your social insurance number will have an end date and it will correspond to when your study permit ends. When you apply for an extension, your study per, your social insurance number stays the same. So you can continue to be paid under payroll if you're under implied status. You applied, you're authorized to continue to work while waiting for your new study permit or work permit. And once you get your new study permit or work permit, the expiry date, you can go to uh, social uh, the uh, Service Canada and your expiry date will be extended to the end of your new study permit or work permit. When you get your all temporary residence, your social insurance number will start with a nine. When you get your permanent residence, that's when you'll get your permanent number and it won't start with a nine. Because most employers will know this. So whenever you go and apply, if they see your social insurance number, it starts with a nine, they will know that you're not a permanent resident. I'll just add as well that we do host people from Service Canada on campus for the students convenience. So that'll be part of their orientation where they'll be able to meet um, with someone and get set up with their SIN on awesome. campus. Awesome. Okay. Um, is there a periodic gap during the PBDC? That's a program specific question, I believe. Is there, are there gaps or there? Schedule. Yeah, so there are two official reading weeks, and then the winter break is an official break as well. So these would, uh, to my understanding, um, fall outside of those defined periods where um, you are limited to 20 hours a week on your study permit. So I believe in, yeah, those official breaks, you could take on more hours if, if your employer allows. Yes, exactly. So if they're scheduled breaks, they're on the academic calendar, everybody in your program has those, then during those breaks, you can work full time. Uh, or, you know, there's no limits, you can do whatever you however many hours you like, during those official scheduled breaks. Okay, someone has explained that. Okay, post spread. I was just explaining what the PBD is, and then uh, can post baccalaureate students apply for OINP? Uh, it, it it sounds like you guys could qualify for the international student stream, um, as long as you have the job offer. Uh, so you have to meet all of the conditions on there. Mm -hmm. And is the PBD considered as a post grad? Yes. Uh, okay, scholarship question. Um, what are the charges to reach out to a lawyer in case it's required? So we start with the initial consultation. That's when we know we can talk to you about what your options are. Do tell us if you are coming from Nipissing because we offer Nipissing students a special student rate. It's $100 to come and get your consultation. After you have the consultation, 
we all have a plan for what to do. And once you're ready to execute the plan, and like once we have the plan, then we can tell you if you wanted to hire us at that point, you know, what our fees would be for, you know, applying for permanent residence or other things that you need us to do. But the initial start, the initial consultation is crucial. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, this one's about student advisors from the university. I think that may be all of the immigration related questions. We made it. We made it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, guys, uh, for letting us come and, and talk to you. Thank you so much, Kyle and Eves, uh, for hosting this as well. Of thank course. You, thank, thank, you. You. thank you, Mary. Thank you so much. Yeah. And thank you to all the students who stuck with us. Um, and we look forward to meeting with you again very soon. Our next session will be uh, Monday, November 20th. Um, and you will receive links and invitations for that very soon as well. Thank you, everyone. Take care, everyone. Bye. Have a good